called the meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is an open meeting of the Seward, Nebraska governing body. The city of Seward abides by the Nebraska Open Meetings Act in conducting business. A copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is displayed on the north wall of this meeting room facility as required. Disclosure of meeting recording process is posted in the meeting room. A participant sign-in sheet is available for use by any citizen addressing the council. Presenters shall approach the podium, state the name and address for the clerk's record, and are asked to limit remarks to five minutes. All remarks shall be directed to the mayor, who shall determine by whom any appropriate response shall be made. The city of Seward reserves the right to adjust the order of items on this agenda if necessary, and may elect to take action on any of the <coughs> items listed. Please call the roll. Beck. Here. Coulterman. Present. Camper. Here. Singleton. Here. Hendricks. Here. Wilkin. Here. Uh, next, we have the uh, draft minutes of January 4th, 2022. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Say so none. Please register your votes. Please spread the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin, Beck, Camper, Coulterman, Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. The next five items make up this evening's consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Say so none. Please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin, Beck, Campus, Coulterman, Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. Next, we have mayor appointments. We have the reappointment of Brett Wapkin, Andrea Bach, and Jim Blocky to the Parks and Recreation Board for a three year term. Vote to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin, Beck, Campus, Coulterman, Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. All right, uh, next we have our first public hearing for this evening. This is tax increment financing tip application by Dwell Development uh, LLC for 1313 West Highway 34 Seward. We have our tip attorney, Andrew Willis, with us. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Members of City Council. Um, the tip application was submitted by Dwell Development LLC. It's a residential uh, project, and so I just go through. Materials. I'd start off by saying this has been recommended by Planning Commission and recommended and approved by the CRA. Those meetings were last week, so it's been through those meetings and got support of both those those boards. Was it unanimous? Do you know? Do you recall? Yes, it was. Okay. Yes, on both. Yep, that's right. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think of any real relevant comments. Uh, the CRA, you know, the the it was reported that the school board had discussed it and they were they didn't have they were not opposed to it in any way so there was support there um, and yeah kind of general support all around uh, the tip application I'll you know they, they submitted a lot of materials and it really got into the, the the plan amendment so I won't go through that very detail but I would note that with that they submitted uh, you know some some project cost pro forma some good numbers to look at we can discuss if needed the um, letter from the bank or the general uh, commitment to finance and then the real estate purchase agreement that purchase agreement for this property is is contingent on TIF approval so again but for TIF uh, as part of the uh, part of the test that that purchase agreement is contingent upon uh, the approval of the redevelopment agreement um, and other than that I took most of you know, that so let's just go right into the amendment to the redevelopment plan and again this would be uh, this is it's about a $7.3 million residential, you know, uh, apartment infill in -field developments, the lot uh, 1313, um, right along you know, Highway 34. So the, just, you know, it's fire kind of, it's been in disrepair. You know, it's a lot that needs redeveloped. It's, it's, uh, it kind of fits the mold pretty well. Um, it would be 43 units. Plan for 21 one bedroom, 22 two bedroom units. Um, and again, this is zoned urban corridor mixed use, so it's permitted use within that within the current zoning. 
and it's within the area designated for future residential under the future land use map, so it fits in very well there. Um, Again, as I mentioned, just from a pure site, uh, you know, land use. I guess one of the comments from the planning commission was, you know, this was kind of the site that we, that you know this needs to be redeveloped and is a good use of, of tip in that sense, just because it's, it needs some demo, needs to be upgraded since that fire a while ago. Um, again, so the 52,000 square feet, roughly apartment building. I said 21 one bedroom, 22 two bedroom units. Uh, clubhouse, nine attached garages, 22 t detached garages, and then the rest, 54 surface parking stalls. Um, this is really targeted as workforce housing, and um, they, they provided some, some rent limits in their TIP application, and so I guess I'd note two things on that. One is, you know, statutory definition of workforce housing. <coughs> Uh, that NIFA uses and that's in the in, in state statutes for certain purposes, that's really based on building costs. Um, it's adjusted annually, so it's 215000 per unit for rental housing. And so this falls within that affordable housing, that workforce housing definition. But then another definition that <clears throat> I tend to look at, or, or at least just as an informative, is looking at HUD rent limits. And so the rent limits that they provide in the application are right between that, you usually look at like 60 to 80% AMI under HUD's limits for the areas, for the Seward area, and, that, and it falls right in that area. So again, that's not, a, that's not a legal definition, but it does fall within what a lot of people consider workforce housing and affordable housing. So, um, so it does sort of hit that target, that target point of workforce housing, which is the, which is the intent here. Intended construction would be, would start this year, uh, 2022, it would probably be complete in 23, but they anticipated that it would be part, mostly done so that the effective date for TIF purposes would be January 1st of 2023. Uh, base value, current value is just under $200,000, 198710 uh, Based on the projected, you know, the projected completed value from the assessor's office was $3.8 million, $3,805,140. Million so uh, that's where we got the, the tax increment. Uh, and again, this is, so that really generates 654500 in TIF over the 15 years at 5% interest. Again, it's $7.3 million construction cost. They've identified over 850,000 in eligible uses for that 650, so no, no issue from the TIP sources and uses. We've got 550 in site acquisition. Uh, we got demolition, grading, site prep work, and then some architectural engineering. So again, typical TIP fees, uh, TIP, TIP uses, good uses that uh, fall under the statute. And again, more than, more than the, the amount of the TIP indebtedness. Um, They've identified that the you know financing of the overall 7.3 look a little over a million in redeveloper equity, about 4.85 in bank you know primary bank loan, uh, looking at some other economic development funding, and then the tip of course being a, a big piece of it. Uh, as I mentioned, when we look through the statutory elements, this is under it's under the site's under contract for, for purchase by the redeveloper. Um, this, you know, from a population density standpoint, we, we look at that, but again, by design, we're trying to, this is the purpose here, is to create housing. So yes, it's going to, it's going to increase the population density, and that's the purpose, it conforms with a comprehensive plan. And um, so that's uh, a yes on that, but by design. Um, no issues from land coverage, it's a, it's a little under two and a half acre lot, It'd be about, again, it's a 52,000 square foot apartment complex in all. Um, from a traffic street layout, it's on Highway 34. Uh, the assumption is that it can handle the additional traffic in that site. Shouldn't be any issues there. Parking under the zoning ordinance for those 43 units. Um, so it's it's one and a half spaces per one bedroom unit, two spaces required per two bedroom unit. So that would be 76 parking off street parking spaces would be required under the plans. There's 83. So. Uh, more than more than required shouldn't be, you know so presumably we've got enough there again from a zoning perspective it's it's a permitted use no issues there and it really hits a lot of the goals of the comp plan um, I won't go you know it's promoting the ones that I highlighted promoting infill development expanding housing expanding housing diversity by type and cost um, it, you know one of the point one of the goals of the uh, actions in the comp plan is to establish incentives for vacant lot development again that's what we're doing here, uh, expanding, ha expanding housing diversity by type and cost, supporting uh, mixed income housing with uh, incentives like this. 
And then again, the uh, comp plan identified a shortage of rental units. Um, and then that was also identified and reiterated in the housing study as well. So again, this hits, it, it, it's, it's filling the need that's identified in the comprehensive plan. <coughs> From the cost benefit in the cost benefit analysis, I already went through the the numbers uh, based on a three point eight million dollar completed valuation. It's about sixty two thousand five hundred uh, annual tax increment dollars. So that's the tax shift per year. That gives us the six hundred fifty four thousand over fifteen years. Um, really, there's no I mean there's no adverse effects noted. This is uh, creating housing. And so, obviously, from an employer's perspective, that's driving. You know, that's driving. There's there's a need for workforce housing um, that will help out employers. We see that as a positive. Um, from the student populations, went through kind of some averages in the cost benefit analysis. And again, I note that the the school board didn't have any concerns with this project as reported to the CRA. Um, so really, with that, that's that's kind of the, uh, the amendment to the redevelopment plan that lays out the project. I'm happy to answer your questions, but also just jump through the redevelopment agreement real fast, and then I can answer anything, because again, this is gonna look very similar to what you've seen before. We've got the minimum project valuation, 3.8 million, 3 million, 805,140 to, to, to reach that TIF amount. Uh, we've got the effective date as January 2023, one year from now. Uh, you would know that they've got the ability in here. One thing they had asked for is just if there's a delay, that they can push that back one year to January 24, um, which again makes sense. It's not not an issue really from from uh, just pra pra a practical perspective. When it's built, we want to set the effective date at the right time. Um, the tax increment. Again, I, I noted that the amount already that we've, that we've authorized in here, and I know that, um, and again, otherwise it's, it's very similar to, to what you'd expect to see on a project like this. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the, about the plan or the, uh, the development agreement. No, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, Andrew. Um, you know, we haven't done much for housing when it comes to TIF, and we had a subdivision that did not go through. Um, but I think this is a different animal entirely. Uh, even the apartment complex over by Concordia is a different intent, it was a different marketing. Like, what it, this is, you know, when I hear, oftentimes when you hear of workforce housing or, or affordable housing, um, they assume you mean houses. Right. <laughs> and the reality is, is it's more about a roof over a head for, for me personally of, of having a place where, uh, especially if, if with, with, with pet source, you know, coming to Seward, not, not planning <coughs> the expansion, you know, for me, it makes a lot more sense of if you're someone who's just starting out working there, you get the choice if you, if you can't find something in Seward that works, then you're going to probably start another community, maybe Lincoln commute in and then you know you make life choices you get married have kids join a church all those things in Lincoln and then when that house is available in Seward well now it's less attractive and less likely I think for them to make that move pull their kids out of school etc to me an apartment and we haven't had a, I, I correct me if I'm wrong but I'm guessing the apartments by the old, by the North Water Tower are probably the last large Apartment complex. If anyone remembers anything, the newest. The that's yeah. The newest. Yeah. yeah, and that's been what thirty years. <laughs> At least twenty-five, thirty years. It's gonna take twenty-five. So it's not some. So <laughs> apartment buildings is something that is not being regularly built in the community where where family houses are. Um, it's just about, um, and, and from that standpoint, I think it's it's this is a great project because it addresses the need. It it, it puts a lot of roofs available in. <laughs> In an area where people can maybe you know come to Seward, try out the community, work in Seward, and maybe end up staying in Seward, and and they don't have to deal with the housing market, which right now is kind of insane. Uh, and so, no, I I think this is very exciting when it comes to utilizing TIF for housing purposes. I think this is a great use. Plus, as mentioned before, this is a location that's already a dilapidated or I mean by definition blighted 
you know, area, um, and one, you know, John, you've talked about, you know, trying to get that area rehabilitated in the past, so this is a great way to accomplish that as well. So I'm really excited about this. I think, not that we need to go full in on housing, on TIF for housing, but I think this is a very, more of a surgical approach than it, than it is, um, the, you know, a, a broad uh, approach that a whole development would look like had we gone that direction. Yeah, I, and I think that's a, I think that's a good point there. I mean, there, there's different, every, you know, the housing projects you mentioned, they're very different projects. And I know sometimes there's a concern that TIF for housing means TIF for any housing, and clearly that's not the case. I mean, this is, each, each project, no matter what, whether it's commercial or residential, uh, the CRA than the council is looking at individually, and and you know this is much different than, than the others. And and one thing that is particularly in apartments, what you're doing, I mean, the housing market with single family homes is to some extent, you know, that it's driven by market conditions. With apartments, it, you're really buying down rents. I mean, you are if you want rents, I mean, the rents are going to be set by the cost of the project. So this is a way to create that level of housing, otherwise, or you're building cheaper apartments, one of those two things. And so, uh, they are very different projects, and I don't think that this, anytime you approve a project, you're not setting precedent that says, now we have to approve every project, but this very much is a different project than others, so. But you like to have a good project to be the first project yeah. to kind of raise the bar for, mm -hmm. for later projects you can say aren't as good if you don't want to do them. <laughs> we would never do that, but. Any other questions or comments, Sid? Just or, a quick, quick question, either for, you or Jonathan, on the rent, I haven't rented forever in water, and I want to admit, but the rental values that you have on this attachment, is that pretty comparable? Maybe, I mean, any of you? Yeah, for, for newer units, I mean, just for an example, uh, and, and Alyssa can talk to this as well, um, in some of her new developments, kind of the IH Fury building apartments are starting at 900. Um, and so, and from a practical standpoint, I, and Rachel can speak to this more, we want to try to get to that 30% uh, you know, gross income, HUD guidelines. So we're, we're thinking somebody that's working about a $40,000 a year job, um, that's 30% of, of income. So that, that fits right within that. Um, it, that was a target that we had specifically identified in the housing study. Based on just, you know, based on HUD's numbers for the Seward area, it, you know, for a one bedroom, it's, you know, the 60% would be 1,000 bucks a month. And then 80 percent, like 1380, so just under 1400 bucks a month. So that's kind of that window of HUD affordability. And then for two bedroom, 1165 to 1500 is kind of the that's the for for the sewer area. That's the designated amounts. Thank you. Um, thank you for the explanation. And uh, couldn't be a better project. Couldn't be a better site. Couldn't be a better time. I'm really excited about this, as the mayor indicated. Um, I think it fits just exactly what we need in terms of workforce housing for the people coming in, school or Tenneco, wherever, Hughes Brothers, all those places, young workers, getting a head start, staying in the local community and building a future here. So thank you and um, for bringing it all in and um, I'm really excited to support this. Thank you, Ellen. Any other questions or comments from the council? If not, so does that complete A, B, and C? Yes. Okay. I think that's everything you need to hear from me. All right. Then we move on to D. A resolution approving. Oh, it's a public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget. Is there any public comment to the public hearing? Anyone from the public wish to comment on the Jonathan? Or would you yeah, like to speak? I'd like to just speak quickly Go since ahead. I came and um, I won't take up too much time. Rachel Glock, thank you all. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Dwell Development. My address is 1901 Southern Light Drive, Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, so I didn't have too far of a drive to come. Uh, I just wanted to tell you, or take the opportunity to thank you all for being here this evening for this hearing, um, but also tell you a little bit about Dwell Development and kind of our goals and objectives also. Um, so based in Lincoln, Nebraska, we're pursuing projects across the state of Nebraska. Um, a lot of them are these more rural communities that haven't seen a lot of new units in quite some time, but also then require some uh, navigation through the incentives in order to bring the projects to fruition. You know, we um, have used the term workforce, and, and in some respects that's just so you understand that 
uh, we're not looking to utilize TIF dollars to build luxury high-end units that are going to be, you know, we really want to fill a community need. And so we're targeting those communities that have a need and a willingness to help support it with some community incentives. And then also another goal or objective of ours is to hold all of these projects long-term. And so to really be a long-term partner in the communities that we go into and continue to oversee them with that mindset that, you know, this is a part of us and, um, you know, what can we be doing better? What does this particular project need for this community in order to make it successful? Um, so, yeah, and then, you know, I think the last part is without TIF and the rural workforce housing dollars and all of these things, you know, these projects are challenging. You see the performance. I mean, they're challenging with the incentives, so they're impossible without. Um, but I, I do appreciate uh, your willingness to support it, and it sounds like, you know, um, everybody, or there's a, a, a very underlying tone of agreement as it relates to um, utilizing this mechanism for the project, so I appreciate that also. That's all. I guess, does anybody have questions for me? Do you have property management that you guys have, or do you hire companies that provide that, or do you hire within the community to provide that service? Yes, so typically we hire a third party property manager. This project's gonna be a little bit smaller um, than some of the other projects that I've worked on, and so we'll have to be a little bit creative as it relates to um, my past experience, but yes, we would look for somebody within the community to, or probably a couple of individuals within the community to help with the property leasing, along with maintenance, and um, and try to just find some great partners. Uh, it'll honestly probably be a part-time position for someone, but we would look for um, somebody who is here local, and then we'll really leverage our technology in order to help make, you know, do virtual walkthroughs if that's the case, and then also the part-time person would be available to make appointments and actually show the units, but um, I would foresee a third-party property management company along with, um, then we'll find somebody, you know, most likely local, mm -hmm. who, because otherwise it's challenging to come over for appointments here or there, but um, if we could find somebody here within the local community that we could hire to show them off, that's usually the best. And then they give a really great representation. You know, oftentimes people are going into apartments, they're completely unfamiliar with the community, and so then they're like, oh, and here is the school, and the hike and bike trails go right behind here, isn't that so great? You can hop on it and get to X, Y, and Z, so, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Rachel, have you, um folks secured the LV840 and the workforce, the rural workforce housing funds already? Rural workforce has been secured. The LV840 is next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, well, thank you. you. Anyone else from the public wish to comment on this item? Very, very briefly. Jonathan, welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jonathan Jenk with the Sewer County Chamber and Development <coughs> Partnership. I just wanted to briefly add, we secured uh, four letters of support um, Pack and Save, Hughes Brothers, Tenneco, and Pet Source. We asked them sort of what is, is housing a need that you've identified in the community and all of them said yes and they were happy to provide support letters. So I wanted to make sure that, oh, that would be great. I'll just generally say I've been um, in Economic Development Chamber of Commerce work here in the community for about 10 years now, and I've been thinking about what do we do with this property for quite a while, and so I, I really do just want to affirm that I think this is one of the highest and best uses that we could do with this property, and so I would appreciate your consideration of support to, to help it move forward. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. Anyone else from the public wish to comment on this item? Seeing no one else, I will close the comment portion of the public hearing. We'll then move on to item B, resolution approving redevelopment plan amendment and adopting a cost benefit analysis for the redevelopment project. Only reduce resolution. All right, 
the resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number 2022-1. Would anyone like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please play the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin, Beck, Camper, Coltman, Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. Uh, item E, resolution approving the redevelopment plan agreement for a redevelopment project, including the issuance of TIF indebtedness for the redevelopment project and other such actions under the community development law. Does anyone like to introduce that resolution? I'll introduce it. Go ahead. Uh, Alan. Alan, will Sorry. introduce the resolution? That's fine. All right. Uh, resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number 2022 2. Would anyone like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin, Beck, Campers, Coulterman, Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. Thank you. Um, Item number two, also a public hearing. This is a special use permit for 335-353-379-401 and 409 South 3rd Street and 348, 340, and 336 Ash Street to allow construction of single family homes and residential living in Central Business District. Great. I got this one. You got this. Yeah, you get me. Um, this is an application pursuant to our Platting of the CNG development, the old middle school site, at the same time that that was platted and took place, I think right after that there was a rezoning to make it Central Business District. By making it Central Business District at that time, there's a bunch of rules and regulations about residential living in Central Business District that now caused us in all these what we have always defined as, I think, planned to be residential units in this area now all had to get special use permits. So uh, that's what you have before you tonight. I can kind of fill you in on the background, but essentially uh, we have the applicant uh, Plex Construction. Uh, if you look at the nice map that was provided for planning and zoning, essentially those three lots on the south side adjacent to Ash, and then the, it looks like five lots located uh, along 3rd Street are all looking to provide for I believe two and three unit residential development uh, along those, and so essentially townhouses. Um, one of the things we're gonna do, this was approved unanimously by Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, one of the things we're gonna do to help resolve an issue uh, that we've come up with is when you rezoned it, you had to have the front of the facility face the street. But when they built those townhouses, they basically fronted them if you look at them, onto the private driveway, they're addressed, at least for the Ash Street ones. Third Street is not an issue. Those do front on the third. So another issue that popped up is with that new rezoning now, not along with the special use permit, was also that you had to face them onto Ash Street. Well, that's going to be kind of tough with the, the decline there, the hill, um, and the fact that those other units don't face that way in the way they look. And so what we worked through the exercise was with Sarah and Tim and myself um, is that what we plan to do, and I don't believe we need anything other than, I think, an adoption by council down the line, is we are going to designate the roadway within there as a private drive. It doesn't need to be replatted. It doesn't need to be anything else because on the plat it's already designated as a public access way. It just doesn't have a name. So we'll designate it as a private drive. I think the name that the developer is proposing is Addy Lane. We'll install those blue um, designated road signs. So if you see those around, they're more predominant in Lincoln, but we should be using them. Um, and that denotes that it's a private lane. Uh, that's not maintained by the city then. And so we'll allow for that. And now there'll be a access roadway that's named for dispatch, postal service, everything else. Uh, we'll work through, the developer agreed to help us work through with uh, the neighbors over there, but I think everybody with an agreement, it's a pretty much a big headache that we never ha really had a great solution for until it was all finished off. And so that will be the other solution that we'll find, uh, and we'll rename that, and that will kind of take care of that issue. So I can answer any other questions. Um, there was some discussion about an HOA over there. They're continuing to work through some of those issues. 
but by approving this, this would add a lot more users down there that can help foot the cost of uh, maintenance and snow removal and things like that over there. So, uh, uni again, unanimously approved by Planning and Zoning Commission. I do have a question. This is just for education purposes of things. In the CBD, which is the Central Business District, mm -hmm. to have residential living, it has to be less than 50% of the business storefront. Is there an area in that CBD that lists specific residential like this, since there's no business front? So like if the eye doctor's place no longer is the eye doctor, mm -hmm. do they automatically get to turn that into a house, a home, an apartment being in the CBD or because it was a business at one point in time, only 50% of that can be occupied as residential? Uh, it would come back as, there's certain uses, I don't have the whole matrix in front of me, there's certain uses that are allowed and I think every single one of them is special use. So again, you would be able to say, hey, this is designed as business storefront, we're not going to approve a special use permit for that. Okay. So. This is a weird one because you guys did, I think if you looked at the order things were done, I think we approved the original townhouses and then we rezoned it. And it was kind of a strange alignment. And so we kind of created our own little problem down there. And the fact that you can't get a lot of things in there. You can't build single family residential down there in these lots the way they're platted. They're too narrow. They have to be townhouses. So... Um, I don't think under the current ones, though. That I just want to make sure that in the future, if something like that was to... It's like, not just a permitted use. That, like, if the church yep. was no longer a church, now we suddenly have a complex there. <clears throat> that that was a business at some point in time. Just questioning. Did we do that because of the wellness center, possibly? Well, the original design by CNG yeah. was to have townhouses. Mm -hmm. Remember, the original, original plan was, like, these brownstone townhouses like you'd see like in DC in larger cities and then it kind of turned into something less than than that but it was still uh, platted for those that size of a, of a structure you'll need to continue to be based on the comp plan and planning and zoning you'll need to continue to be diligent in the CBD of where you put residential and what you allow and just the way we design it you'll have to just be the gatekeepers so defining the use and the styling of the building and stuff. So. But that's the thing with the special use permit though, you know, it's not like you're grandfathering in um, whatever you approve. I mean, the next person would have to come back and get permission for what they're going to do. So you would always will have control over what goes in to not, not just new, but uh, you know, the next time it changes hands, if somebody wanted to put a different, you know, business in there, that's, that would require a special use permit. So it, from the council standpoint, it gives you a lot of control um, rather than a generic zoning where as long as it fits this category, you can do it. Did uh, Sean and all those guys like the idea? As far as ch the chiropractor, the eye vision, has anybody reached out to them? Do they know? Yeah, we sent the notices to the 300 feet in every direction. So, so we, didn't, we haven't heard anything that I know of. Any other questions or comments from the council? It's a public hearing, so I'll go ahead and open up the public comment portion of the public hearing. Anyone from the public wish to comment on this item? Seeing no one, then I will close the public comment portion of the public hearing. We turn to the council for discussion, and for this, I believe it just requires a simple motion. Move to approve. Second. Any motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please sway the votes. Voting in favor of Woken Back Campaign Culture Manager Nathan Hendricks, 6 0. All right, next we have an ordinance amending the Seward Municipal Code, Chapter 12, Boards, Commissions, and Committees, Article 8, Airport Authority, Section 1, Membership, Scope of Authority. <coughs> Greg. Yeah, we had a resignation on the Airport Authority, and so we went in to make sure we were going to follow the process correctly for the reappointment. Um, amazingly enough, they don't reappoint their own members, like the county board has a mechanism for that, things like that. 
they default to the mayor making the appointment with approval by council. And so, um, as dissociated as we are with the airport authority to some extent, um, the only thing we noted was when we read through it, um, the city council or the city code read as if you filled the term until the next general election, whatever that was. Which would be this year. Yeah. And then the term currently for the person that resigned technically goes until the following election two years later. And I said, hey, we should probably go look at that just to make sure because that seems really seems strange. And so Derek and I did the research. We found the state statute that corresponds to it. The state statute seems very clear. It goes till the end of the term. So three years from now. So we bypassed the, this year's election. Mm -hmm. So we sent it all to Kelly, and Kelly said, don't do the appointment, change the ordinance, state statute rules, make sure it's cleaned up. That's what we drafted. And then we'll do the appointment at the next meeting if this is approved. I can answer any questions you have. It's a weird, it's just a, a weird random one that we come across once in a while, but. Good. All right. Well, it's an ordinance, so would someone like to introduce the ordinance? I'll introduce the ordinance. All right. An ordinance to amend the Municipal Code of the City of Seward, Chapter 12, Boards, Commissions, and Committees, Article 8, Airport Authority, to clarify the length of appointment for an appointed board member, to repeal all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict, to provide for an effective date, to provide for publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form. The ordinance has been read by... Hagel and is hereby uh, and is designated as. Hang on a second. I haven't done these in a while. <laughs> designated as ordinance number 2022 1, and the title is hereby approved. I need a motion to dispense with statutory rule. Um, second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? Say no. Please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor of Wilkin Beck, Campus Culturman, Singleton Hendricks, 6 0. The or, this is ordinance number 2022 1. We would like to move that this ordinance be passed and adopted as read. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question is shall ordinance number 2022 1 be finally passed and adopted? Please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin Beck, Campus Culturman, Singleton Hendricks, 6 0. I think this is our only ordinance this evening, so only one final motion to make this ordinance a part of the permanent record. So moved. We have a motion second. and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin Beck, Campus Culturman, Singleton Hendricks, 6 0. All right, item number two annual certification of fire department list. Uh, this is a certification that we do every year to the uh, Department of Revenue, and this provides uh, those listed with a, a tax incentive based on state statute. So this is well, the only thing I would, in the future, when we bring it to public knowledge, I would blank out the last four of the Social Security. Numbers. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the council? This is, it's not, that's not your entire roster. That's just the people that have qualified for the incentive. That's correct. correct. That's correct. Just wanted to make that clear for the record. Yeah, there's 32. Any other questions or comments? Or would someone like to make a motion to approve? The I'll make a motion to approve. Second. With a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin Beck, Campreth, Culturman, Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. All right, item number three resolution prohibiting parking on the north side of Lincoln Street between 6th and 9th Street during snow conditions. Okay. Yes, we received a request back in maybe the early fall last summer. Along Lincoln Street and a few other areas in town, we have essentially, due to the narrowness of the roadways, we prohibit parking entirely from November through March, basically the snow season. And we received a request and said, hey, essentially when you guys clear snow, you can only not park on that street. You know, there's only eight days really that it's an issue or however many days we actually have a snowfall throughout the season uh, when it's a problem. 
is there any way we can look at solutions so that we can utilize those the rest of the year, those other, you know, 50, 60, 70 days a year that you're telling us not to park there? And so we went through the traffic committee, reviewed it, we looked at other communities, and we did locate a number of communities that include language like what we've proposed here. Essentially, and I think we included the signs as well. Uh, these, both of these signs would work. Uh, if you want to give direction or we can just work with chief on this one and chief was on the traffic committee as well on this one um, Essentially is we can have a no parking sign when when the road is snow covered or when snow removal conditions exist uh, Probably default to snow covered because you can go look there's snow on the ground. So that probably meets muster but uh, essentially this gives the opportunity uh, to allow those that live in that area to utilize Lincoln Street for parking under normal circumstances when we don't have snow, snow removal. Uh, we only did from 6th Street to 9th Street as a test. That's in the area of the person that requested it. And so we'll go through the rest of the season, see how it works, see if we have problems, if we're not having issues. We can look to expand it. Um, I know when I brought it up to some other areas of the town, they said, you should remove parking entirely all the time on this roadway. And I went, Okay, that's the complete opposite direction of where we were going, but we'll talk with you about it. So, um, we think this is reasonable. The traffic committee was okay with it. We'll see how enforcement goes. If it becomes a big headache, then we might recommend just going back to the way it was before. But I think that's the adequate wording. I mean, we have emergency snow route. When the road is snow covered, you can have a half inch of snow, and it can be snow covered. The problem that we're trying to avoid by, by saying, like, the other option was when, when removal conditions exist is you, you want to have a threshold that anyone can see is met or not. And if you're going to say removal, if that's two inches or is it two inches, I believe, that, that just becomes confusing, I think, more so because people are going to argue, well... It was only an inch and a half. <laughs> right. And, and, and unless we're going to put rulers everywhere out along the, on the curve to measure the snow, it's probably just simpler to either say there's snow or there isn't snow. And of course, there could still be some confusion because obviously you can clear a road and still have some snow on it. Um, but that's why this is kind of a pilot program to see how it goes. And if it becomes a cluster and people are confused and there's one, there's one car still parked there and everyone else moved, then we can revisit this and go back maybe the way it was. But at least we're trying to, to be responsive to what we're hearing from the neighborhood and see how it goes. But yeah, unfortunately a perfect sign doesn't exist. Um, but we can hopefully can at least communicate that to people in a way that, that we can be consistent. In, in five years, I've, we've declared one snow emergency, and it was the biggest mess mm -hmm. of any snow removal in five years. And it wasn't the biggest snow removal. We find that we're getting a better response on social media, just asking people, hey, we're going to do our due diligence. We're going to try and get out at 2 a.m., be clear by 6. If you get everything off the road you can, we are far more efficient. Mm -hmm. And we get way better response, Bob and the crew say, than we ever got doing the snow emergency, because the snow emergency, I think, just was confusing people. Opposite side, left side, south side, north side, even side, yeah. odd side, which one, when does it turn? When are you switching it? <laughs> and it was just more of a headache for, for Chief and their crew trying to chase people down, where honestly, just making a good, nice social media, um, blast and getting a lot of shares and, and doing that we get the roads cleared faster doing that than we ever did trying to confuse people with the snow emergency we think this one's all right again we've never been abusive since i've been here you know things change personnel change i don't think we've ever been abusive had any problems with trying to we do our best to contact them even if they're in violation and just go hey can you move this car you know, is there any way we can get this out of the way we need to come back through? And we still do that even afterwards because our predominant safety issue is the people that we plow in, they'll come back two days later, they'll move their car, they'll scoop out just in front of it, drive off, mm -hmm. we'll get another snowstorm, and then you will never see that giant icy mound that's a foot tall until you run into it and damage your vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so we always try to go back through and Bob and working with chief in the PD and contact those people and scoop that snow off again. It's a big headache, but it's a safety issue. So do you plan on sending letters out to the households that face 
this area just explaining we can to them so because 90 percent of the people that are going to be parking there are either residents or friends or family that are visiting so that you can be like hey just wanted to let you know this is our test we just want to make you aware of the fact that if it does snow please remove your vehicles and they can't be on there during the duration of time i want to use please I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna say, remove your vehicles. But, we're more but of a I mean, shout. I think I'm, just, uh, I'm sure most of you guys know in chat. that area. But to have closer up or down, if there wasn't somebody that was in that community meeting to understand it, then at least you've done your part and made them aware of it. Oh. So yeah, we can send out a letter. I think I don't know, but we may have one that faces on that Aldmer side yard. We'll still do it. We'll still hit that side of the roadway. It was probably like six letters, ten letters. Yeah. Ten letters. So. Any other uh, questions? Yes. Resolution. All right. The resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number 2022-3. Would anyone like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor are Wilkin, Beck, Camper, Tolterman, Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. All right, item 4 resolution placing ADA parking stalls along the west side of 5th Street between Main Street and Seward Street along the Courthouse Square. Greg. This is part of our continued analysis of downtown. Again, the standard bearer for us for ADA parking stalls is if you have a full block length of parking, you need about one stall. You have full block length, whether those are parallel or diagonal parking. Again, Courthouse Square has three sides of parking. One side's the highway with no parking, so technically to facilitate all the ADA required parking for that would be three stalls. Right now, the only stall we have is up in the northeast corner is the only stall that's adjacent to the block. And so we've been working through Daryl and, and the county commissioners to try <laughs> and identify this um, and add two additional stalls. The third stall will remain as well in its current location. Uh, these are in the primary closest location that we could locate it to get, also get you to the ADA access. The only non-ADA access uh, doorway is the front, the north side. We call it the front, but that's, <laughs> the other ones are all level. The, the north side has a staircase that you have to get up, so it's not ADA accessible. Um, and so we did wait. Uh, this item was on the agenda with the county commission this morning, and they did unanimously approve, correct, Daryl? Right. And so Bob's crew then will go out and we'll take care of the work and add the new ramp. The other good thing is is also add a ramp for the trash there. And so they can either stop backing in to try and load it in the middle of 5th Street and they could just roll it down and then that pull up sense. normal. Um, it is a brick roadway though, so it might shake itself to pieces, but um, gives that option as well. Um, but again, just a straight shot in, a more direct one and it fulfills all the ADA uh, requirement for that block base, which we need to continue to work through. It's a responsibility of the city to continue with an ADA plan and to address these issues. When was our last audit? Uh, I have no idea. Hasn't been in five years, so. So will, no, will there need to be one created on the north side nope. as well? This you just, will cover. Yep. And so essentially what they look at is the entire block, the physical block. You could locate all four, if you had four sides of parking, gotcha. you could put all four together. They really want you to try and do an analysis of what your uses are in the proximity to ADA accessibility to those uses. So we have one building with one use. Where's the, the worst place we could situate these is put them all on the north side and go, hey, good luck trying to find the entrance that you can get into. And so we feel this is the, the best one um, and so that's that's why we get located over here. Um, the other one that you can do is you can also count private. So when we looked at the block that Cattle Bank, Jimmy John's ultimately be on in spare time, uh, the one stall that's located in the private Cattle Bank parking lot counts as one for that block. Because technically you can park, ADA hand, handicap stalls are the, uh, the parking lot anomaly. It's one of the only things that the police will go onto a private lot and enforce and provide a ticket for. 
but if you pull into Walmart and cross the random yellow lines and park all cattywampus, they're not going to come there and ticket somebody for parking bad. So, but Walmart might kick you out. So, yeah. we're not encouraging. We're not encouraging. Just, I'm just, just saying, noting. if I was in a hurry and it's like snowing or raining, it's, it's the I same reason that, it, that like, those ADA stalls count because you can you can utilize them at any private lot and then go about and do your business. Um, and so we're still working with spare time. They want to have a, a stall. They're just trying to find the perfect makeup of how they want to access that and where they want to put it. But that will be the third one for that block as well then. So we'll have one that we just relocated, the one in Cattle Bank, and then the one in spare time. And we'll just continue to move around downtown and make sure we're, we're working those in. So. We will always frown on Caddy Wampus parking. Yeah. That's a technical term, right, Cody? I want this. I can answer any questions you have. Is it high today? I don't know. I'll introduce the resolution. All right. The resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number 2022 4. We would like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please register your votes. Please sway the vote. Voting in favor is Wilkin, Beck, Camper, Colton, and Singleton, Hendricks, 6 0. All right, next we have consideration of the resolution approving supplemental agreement number five with the Schemmer Associates Incorporated for preliminary engineering services on the Seward Trail project. Greg. I forewarned you that this trail project was taking forever, that this was kind of the big final thing that they were waiting on. We got approval by the County Ag Society for the path through the fairgrounds, not around the fairgrounds and then also the final design approval by BNSF to cross the, uh, the railroad. railroad. Once we got that, we still need to go back and do the official design of that, go out and do shoot the grades, do the survey work, and do the final engineering design of those. We have been threatened by NDOT and federal, mainly Federal Highway, who's administering this grant, that it was highly likely they may not fund that stuff because this thing has gone on for so long, but we said, hey, we, we only have control over the railroad. If you ever try to work with them, they'll do whatever they want. And you federal government aren't even gonna tell them what to do. <laughs> and so we were like, really, really hoping that they would cover this, because this is an 80-20 split, along with a portion of it also being covered by the state for this project. Otherwise, these could be significant costs, and it would all have been borne by the city. And so I had to write like a dissertation <laughs> justifying this that Mike helped me with. It felt like writing a term paper justifying why they should help cover this and allow us to do it and they did do that and so it has taken a very long time i think i turned that in in april last year correct and we just got it so is that both locations of the railroad or just this location it doesn't here? cross the other location there's no other it goes once it goes around i believe it goes it underneath goes, yeah. the river under the bridge the through the campgrounds and then over to the wastewater plant yeah. under that bridge yep it's designed to go under the bridge and under the Highway 34 bridge as well, over by Pack and Saves. Most of it's located on the the water side of the of the levee. <clears throat> so the purpose of having an outside engineer versus our inside engineer is why? Because they already designed. It's, like it's too much work. It is several hundred thousand dollars.